Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are a fan of true, creepy, scary, or disturbing stories, I would love to have you join the Back to Ashes family. So, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. And with that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play, or read the first story an ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Story time, in no particular order, all real, all strange, some horrifying. My friend and I, aged 11 to 12, summer, house development in Illinois. My first summer in my new home, out in the sorta of sticks. My friend from school and I loved to run around the neighborhood and into the forest behind the homes. While we were out, we noticed an ice cream truck kind of tracking us. It had its music running, so we sort of wrote it off and continued on our adventure. Every time we'd pop out of the woods again, the ice cream truck would never be too far behind. Same driver, same plate. We laughed and joked about it being some new, weird business tactic to get kids to buy. However, we were broke, so we just kept playing. The stalking was incessant. After a while... Every turn we'd make, no matter where we'd pop up in the housing development, it was always near. The driver always pretending he didn't see us, but keeping pace as we walked. Eventually, it was time to go home, and so we did. When I returned home, I told my mom about the experience, and so she called the police. After a bit of questioning, they decided I was just letting my imagination run wild but they check it out anyways. The initial search of the neighborhood turned up nothing but a single ice cream truck driven by a woman ran by a reputable company. About a week later, they got a similar report by some other young girl in the neighborhood. They found the truck with the exact guy, completely unlicensed, with a little boy unconscious and tied up in the back. I'm going to take you back to something that happened to me from my childhood. Back in the 90s, I was out with my friend in my neighborhood in rural New England. We were about 9 or 10. It was a town where you never have to worry about anything, and kids roam wherever pretty freely. You know the type. This one day, we were out hanging around, roaming like we usually did. We decided this gray station wagon circling our road, it made a big loop about a mile around, and cars going by in general is fairly uncommon. So seeing the same car several times was definitely weird. The first time we saw it, we were eating some snacks up on some rock by the side of the street. We saw the car twice during that time and thought it was odd but kept walking on our way. We were planning to go to her house and get our swimsuits, then go to another neighbor's house for a swim. As we walked, we noticed the car a couple more times and got really panicked. They slowed down a lot going by us, but hadn't said anything yet. We moved into the trees a bit, still walking along the road, but not right next to it anymore. We saw him coming around the bend as we neared some tall bushes and started to panic. He was now moving extremely slow and we could tell he was looking at us. We went into these thick, thick bushes and paused on the other side of them. My heart nearly stopped. We could just make out through the other side 
that he pulled up the car right to the other side of the bushes and was reaching his hand and arm through trying to find us. We held our breath until he slowly drove past, then sprinted into the thick forest and walked home. With some difficulty, we were so deep in the woods out of fear, and finally made it to her house. We never went swimming. On a separate day, I was hanging out with a different friend in my neighborhood, and, long story short, we saw the gray station wagon yet again. Several times it circled our neighborhood. We were with a bigger group this time, boys and girls, and we all eventually got the courage to walk to one of the boys' homes because their parents were home and we were super scared. The scariest part of this memory is that my parents never believed me about it. I'll never forget how I was almost kidnapped and my mom just did not care. The police were called and we were interviewed several times. Nothing ever really happened. No one was taken, but for a while, some people were understandably freaked out. So guy in the gray station wagon, I hope you never met any kids. And to any adults that wouldn't believe your own child, I hope my kids don't meet you or my mom either. I have no relationship with her, and this isn't 100% why, but it's definitely the majority. So let me start by saying that this is the first time I'm sharing this story, and I really, really hope it's my last. I've been struggling with this for a few years now and still have a hard time talking about it. First, some backstory so you can understand the history I had with him and why it messed me up so badly. Almost 12 years ago, I met a guy, Charlie, online in a video game. We played together for a while, talked every day, eventually exchanged phone numbers, started texting, calling, and inevitably developing feelings for one another. I decide that I'm an adult-ish woman at the ripe old age of 19, almost 20, and that I should make the 3,000 mile move to be with this guy. At this point, we had been talking for almost two years and I felt confident in this choice. He promises me everything a girl could want in a relationship, and I fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. I arrive in a southern Texas town, and he picks me up from the airport, and we drive to his house. We planned I would live in his grandmother's house, being as it was vacant and I could afford the rent. He said since his grandmother had passed away, it was something he has clear with his aunt, and I was all good to move in. He originally told me he would move in with me too, which never happened. The first red flag should have been when he hid me in the house. He never got the permission for me to live there, and it turned out that the house was going to be sold in a few weeks. I ended up on the couch at his parents' house, whom he lived with. His family is very religious, and he didn't want to let them down by finding somewhere else for us. So I lived with them for a few months, paying rent by cooking and cleaning for his family. I get a part-time job working with Charlie at a major clothing retailer. This is very important for later on. I go to his church, fit in with his group of friends, and everything is great. His family likes me, and I'm enjoying my time in Texas. The second red flag I missed was his hesitation to introduce me as his girlfriend. He would simply introduce me as his friend and tell people we were just friends. In private, though, it was the opposite. He would tell me he loved me, how much he cared for me, and that he couldn't wait for us to live together. Everyone knew Charlie and I were together, but he denied it hard. 
About six months of this, I'm approached by some girl whose name I don't remember, and she basically tells me I've stolen her man. That one day, some girl is going to weasel her way in like I did, and I'll know her pain. Then she leaves. I never see her again or anything. Fast forward about two or three years, and I'm finally catching on about his shit. I'm tired of being told in public I'm not his girlfriend, but in private, how much he loves me. We are on and off again at this point, and we still have feelings for each other, and decided to really give it another go. A new girl, Lucy, starts to work with us, and they became fast friends. Her calling at all hours to complain about a jerk boyfriend. I instantly had a bad feeling about her. I hated her. But I tried so hard to like her and be friends, inviting her over for drinks, taking her to concerts, you name it. I tried it against my better judgment. Her birthday comes up, and he takes her to lunch while I'm working. And I see this picture he posted on her Facebook and the look she is giving him in the picture. I just know he is screwing her. My heart sinks. So I confronted him, and he tells me it's an unfair question to ask if he is sleeping with her. So I break up with him, but decide to stay friends. Biggest mistake of my life. Lucy starts talking about Charlie and his skills in bed, bad-mouthing him spreading rumors at work, just crazy stuff. And she blames me. Around this time, Charlie is also passed over for a promotion at work and makes an off-handed comment about how he is going to shoot up the store because of this. Another red flag that I just totally missed. Charlie is let go and rumors run wild. I stay silent because of an investigation at work about the rumors and the comment Charlie made about shooting the place up, and I wanted no part of that mess. About a week, maybe two later, Charlie asks me to go to the movies with him, and I said I would go with him. He then kidnapped me, taking me into the back country, far, far away from anywhere, the middle of nowhere. He parks the car, and I feel super scared at this point. He hasn't said a word in over 30 minutes, and I don't have cell service. He pulls out a gun, cocks it, points it at me, and tells me to tell him the truth, or he will kill me. I start crying, telling him I have no idea what he is on about, and he pulls the trigger. It's empty. He cocks it again and points it again telling me I need to tell the truth, that we are playing Russian roulette, and I would die if I kept lying. He did this three more times. Each time was empty. I'm in hysterics at this point. I can't breathe, I'm crying so hard. He tosses the gun in the back seat with a laugh and says, I'm just playing with you. I wanted to see if you kept your story straight. I had to be sure who was lying to me. I'm so glad it's not you. You're a great friend. And he drives us back to town for the movies, talking the whole time like nothing was wrong. I am terrified, still, and know I have to get away. So I excuse myself partway into the movie. I go into the restroom, call a friend to pick me up, and then I call the cops. When it was all said and done, they couldn't do anything to him because he never actually hurt me and he didn't have the gun when they came to his house, and I had no proof anything happened. I went into hiding and later found out he had planned this out with Lucy, and that it was her way to get rid of me because she was jealous. He went on to date Lucy for a few more years. I've been hiding from him for five years now, and eventually cut all contact with mutual friends when one of them was having lunch with me and told Charlie about it. I thankfully left before he was able to show up. He apparently wanted to talk to me. I hope we never meet again, Charlie.
My parents divorced in 2006. I was 17 when they split, right before their 18th anniversary. It was a long time coming. My dad sustained a head injury four years prior, so his drinking and drug use went from a lot to a cyclone of crazy. So my mom risked it, and she left. Dad left, and we remained in the same house we had moved to from our small town to a small city near our state's capital. It was weird. But the first month he was gone, we had a peace we never knew we could have. And I remember feeling actually free for the first time in my life up until that point. My dad had to be supervised by state police when he collected his stuff as he was violent and threatened to kill me on several occasions. He never cleared out the basement but left garbage and so my mom, myself, and some friends that hung out at the time helped the cleanup effort and we ended up getting overall 200 bucks in returns from all the beer cans. My friends and I got different furniture, instruments, stereos, and a fridge to put soda and beers in as we took over the garage and the basement. My friends and I discovered my dad had been growing weed in the basement as he left all of his plants and equipment behind. At the time, it was illegal in my state. My mom has a job where she could get fired and lose her license as well. My friends and I didn't want to get involved with selling any of it, and we honestly were just interested in having fun on our own terms. We liked to drink, but beyond that, it never got into anything more. So we threw it all out. My dad had told us he got everything, and that was it, and I would never have to interact with him, really. He gave me up during the family court stuff, or so we thought. Our house is on a hill and borders the actual city, which has alleyway access, which led to the small backyard. The basement access was outside only and was kept with a padlock, and the door itself was pretty sturdy. The house was next to a diner and a storage garage, so everything closed after 5 p.m., and there were other houses on the street as well, and is a main drag that connects you to a small highway. I don't remember when it started, but I recall my dad would call our house nightly drunk and accusing my mom of cheating, as he was already living with another woman at this time as well. He would call crying and just belligerent some night. Then we started having people prowl around the house, it started very subtly, until my special needs sister started seeing a ski mask man at her window. I often would chase someone away with a bat some nights, alone by myself, or watching my sister as my mom had to work multiple jobs. I started working as well. I would often wait up most nights and would just patrol, making sure everyone was safe. And most nights, it was nothing. I developed a good layer of trauma from all of this, and a heavy caffeine addiction as I was always on alert. I had suspected a few of my dad's friends, especially since they were very interested in the basement. I am almost not a small person. I had given up playing football and had trained to play for a D1 school, so I was still fresh from all of it and was very strong still. One night, in particular, I remember being awoken by my bedroom window being tampered with. I looked and I saw a man in a ski mask trying to open my window with a large hunting knife in his mouth. I snuck down on the floor and crawled out of my room and into the living room. I grabbed a Louisville slugger I kept by the front door. I got my shoes and jacket on as it was winter. I snuck outside and confronted the man who I recognized as one of my dad's friends. He started talking crap and making fun of me as I warned him he needed to leave or I would hurt him. He took a swing at me with the knife and I pulled back and cracked him on his shoulder as hard as I could and I heard the bones break. I watched his shoulder move in an unnatural way 
as he fell down in the snow. I got on top of him and started punching him over and over, taking the ski mask off. My mom came home and our neighbors came as well as he stopped moving and was unconscious. It took my mom and five others to pull me off of him and they had a hard time. As we waited for the cops, he came to and managed to get up as he tried to run but was having a hard time. As a car came and he hopped in as it took off before we could stop him. This was before ring doorbells and most people had security systems. We all gave our story and the cops took his knife and that was it. Things were quiet for a while before it started again that summer and I had cornered the same guy in the dark in that small yard. He yelled out he wanted his equipment from the basement and I told him we tossed it and he charged me. I picked up a large garden brick we had piled up back there and tossed it overhand and hit him in the same place I did months prior. And I heard bones break yet again. This time I sat on him as he kicked and screamed. My mom called the cops and they came and actually arrested him. They told me that I had broken his collarbone and that he wanted to press charges. Nothing ever came of it and after which the whole situation ended up blowing over and it all stopped. My dad admitted he was involved and wasn't sorry that he pitted these men against his kids and ex-wife, which has altered my relationship with him. I saw that man during the pandemic as our city had a lot of public gatherings and such. And while I am not the same person, I was very happy to see him have a level of healthy fear. Also, another one of the guys involved I had run into as well at the same event last year. He was very cautious about me and referenced he didn't want me to do what I did to his friend. These guys at one point used to fight and run with rowdy people with my dad and it felt good to know that as someone who doesn't get violent, that people who do have a healthy fear to never mess with my family or to try to break into my home. So to the ski mask men, I hope we never meet again or there will be consequences. So I just recently had a memory trigger and I decided I'd like to share it with you all. Quick backstory, I used to live in a very small town that was predominantly safe for kids, only had some drug issues. Anyways, my house was located in a small and upscale part of the town, which mainly housed families. There was a small pond with lots of green in the neighborhood that was about a five minute walk from my house. To get to the pond, you had to go down a grass hill. Neighborhood kids, including myself, would always go down to the pond for hours to catch frogs, skip rocks, etc. Okay, so now to the story. On this particular day, it was raining and pretty cold, so there were no kids at the pond. My best friend, her brother, who was one year older than us, and myself decided to head down to the pond for a bit. After about half an hour, we see at the top of the hill a minivan pull up. We thought nothing of it as there was a neighborhood mailbox at the top of the hill as well, and a lot of people stopped to get their mail. A man started to get out of the minivan, and I remember him being older, probably in his 60s. Another note, since we lived in a small town, everyone knew everyone, or at least could recognize everyone. I remember thinking it was strange that I had never seen this man before in town or in the neighborhood. He got out and just stared at the three of us for what seemed like forever. All of a sudden, he yelled at us and said, It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. My best friend and her brother looked terrified, and I had this gut feeling that something wasn't right. 
We didn't say anything back, and he continued to repeat that phrase. It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. Our fight or flight reaction kicked in, and we all booked it up to the other side of the hill, which was only about a few meters away from him and that minivan. As soon as he saw us running, he got into his minivan and started driving slowly behind us, literally following us until we reached my house. Luckily, my garage door was open and my parents' two cars were parked inside. We hid behind one of my parents' cars and watched as he pulled to the side of my house and parked. My parents were inside, but obviously had no idea what was happening. He stayed parked in front of my house for a couple of minutes until my dad came outside to take out the trash and saw the three of us hiding. I guess the man saw my dad and drove away, but as soon as he left, we told my parents everything. Even until this day, 12 years later, my parents still think we were being overdramatic and that it was a man that was genuinely concerned for our safety because of the weather. Nonetheless, we weren't allowed to go back down to the pond anymore. I don't blame them for thinking this though because the three of us tended to work things up a bit and be dramatic. But I knew from the way I had that strange feeling when I first saw him at the top of the hill that something was off. And to this day, I still believe that he was planning something. So, man at the top of the pond, let's not meet. I hail from a small rural town in Ontario, about an hour from Ottawa. Nothing bad happens there. People don't even lock their car doors at night. I never really thought something like this could happen to me, but then I guess it did. My friend Angie and I were out in Ottawa around early July, sort of near Canada Day if I can recall correctly. We had been bar hopping and having fun exposing ourselves to city life, us being country bumpkins and all. Angie is drunk. I am not because I had to drive us home. No Uber or taxi is going to bring us back to our town, and if they do, it's a $60 cab ride. Me being sober might have been what saved my life. We decided we want to go visit a club. We've never been clubbing before, so we intend to Google a place and head to that location. Instead, we got lost. We're somewhere facing a bunch of duplex housing and a single hotel. Not especially deserted, but out of the way from the neon lights, if you know what I mean. It's silent on this street, completely empty. We decide to turn back and choose another club that's easier to find when we come across these tourists, one male and one female. They're holding a phone and a printed out page of some Airbnb directions, and they approach us asking if we have our phones on us. Angie immediately obliged with them, whipping out her phone. The man explains that he's here on vacation but can't find his Airbnb and needs us to use our phone to call the renters so that he can figure out which house it is. This man's accent is German, I think? Maybe Scandinavian. Definitely not French or Spanish. My friend is willing, but fortunately for her, she used up all of her minutes and can't call anybody. But she can get me to call. Or we could plug in the address on Google Maps and show them the way. Angie turns to me and I panic. This whole time I've been looking at this couple and it's all too weird. How would you be vacationing in a foreign country in today's digital age and not have a phone plan? How would you not know which address is yours if you had a printed copy of your Airbnb in your hands and street signs everywhere? 
Why are they alone in this empty street past midnight? The airport is 30 meters away. If they call a cab to their destination, wouldn't the cab driver drop them off on the doorstep? So many questions are rising in my head, and I completely am getting red flags and anxiety, nauseous. I make up this bullshit lie like I only have an iPod on me, and that I don't have data on my iPod. Angie calls me out on it, but I shut her up and drag her away from the tourists, and closer away to the main hub of downtown. Angie is asking why we didn't help them, and I run my thoughts by her. She looks at me and says, It's strange. I noticed they didn't have any luggage, but I didn't give it a second thought. Needless to say, that concluded our night. So, German, Scandinavian tourists, I hope you're legit and that you found your Airbnb okay, but either way, let's not meet again. This happened while I was in my early 20s. My best friend was always getting into risky shit. While she did various drugs, I was always more of a pothead. When they said pot was a gateway drug, I believe it's true to a certain extent with those who have addictive personalities. She definitely developed an addiction issue later on. My friend, her name was KK, was always down to meet people. She used to befriend random people on Facebook or Instagram. She would ask me to come hang out so that when she met people, I was the buffer just in case they didn't like each other. One day, she came over to my house unannounced and was like, hey, let's go to my uncle's house because her aunt was there and her aunt had some goods. Her aunts happened to be down the road. Her aunt and her uncle were known as dealers in the area. So we went. When we got there, she was like, hey, I met this guy online. He goes by Joey Crack. Then she shows her aunt his picture, and he's a wide-set man with a red goofy face, cornrow braids, face tattoos, and a gold grill. I laughed and said, wow, Kay, you really know how to pick them. She had already invited him over, so upon his arrival, he then comes out of nowhere, just walks straight up and gives Kay a hug, and everyone else there a kiss on the cheek. This part of town, there was nothing around, just houses, a school, and woods. Closest store was about 20 minutes, so it stuck me as odd that he walked here. So it was me. Kay, her aunt, and the aunt's friend. We sit and get three joints in rotation. By this time, the aunts are high as a kite on coke. They take a few puffs, then go inside the house, leaving me, Kay, and Joey crack outside. Joey then starts asking us questions, like how we know each other, what do we do for a living, etc., it was getting late, so I was telling her I was going to go home. She was like, no, please don't go yet. I told her I was tired and that Joey is weird, and he kept low-key hitting on me. She then tells me he asked to sleep with her, and he wanted to ask her to ask if I was down. I laughed it off and said, uh-uh, you're crazy. And after a while of silence, I deflected and heard some noise that was in the darkness. You heard that? After a bit of small talk between him and Kay, he then learned that neither one of us was interested. It was just a hangout. This then turns the mood. You can feel it. It was suddenly eerily quiet. He got reserved and shifty-eyed. I sat down for a while just to please Kay. At one point, I turned to Joey, knowing he walked here and it was dark by now. What about you? What do you do? Because I'm about to go home and Kay's coming with me. He was like, I just texted my boy. He's, he's about to come get me. When he was texting, Kay was right behind him, watching him. 
Her eyes grew wide and she looked at me. That was silent girl code for, bitch, what the fuck? Kay broke the silence and was like, hey, come help me get this thing from inside to bring it out. So I did. We went inside and she was like, I'm gonna call my uncle so he can take us to your place. And I was like, why? My house was like a 10 minute walk. She said, because when she was looking at Joey texting, he went to whoever was coming to pick him up, the information of all three of us here. He noted that our aunts were high on coke and we were along the age group. He was telling us his boy to come over to basically to rob and sexually assault us and called dibs on the blonde one. I was that blonde one. Every hair stood up on my body with the thought of some gross goon trying to have his way with me. I was pissed because she got us into this bullshit. We came back out and continued our conversation with him so he wouldn't get suspicious of us. She mentions out loud that her uncle was on his way home. As he pulls in, a sigh of relief comes over me. They speak briefly and Joey then departs into the darkness before his ride even shows up. Can I get a ride from her uncle to my house? On the ride, we noted how weird Joey really was. Later that night, as I was going to bed, I check my Facebook and I have a friend request from Joey and a message. You're so pretty. I would love some alone time with you without your friend. The message ended with his number. I never blocked someone so fast in my life. After this, Kay didn't learn her lesson, but that's another story for another time. A week later, Joey was in the news. He was wanted for sexual assault, robbery, and drug possession. A bullet well missed on my part. Joey Crack, let's never meet again. This happened when I was a kid, about 12 years old. My family and I lived in the back bayous of South Louisiana, and we didn't have a lot of neighbors, so there were long stretches of woods and water with no people around. One day, my best friend and I were playing between our houses. They were about a half a mile apart, and we were walking on the main road which was really a single lane gravel road with a large red truck, huge tires, double extended cap, came rolling down the road. We knew he wasn't local because there were only a handful of people living back there and we knew them and their vehicles by sight. The truck slowed as it reached us and we were smart enough to back up away from the road out of arm's reach. The man in the truck was your typical redneck, mullet, scraggly beard, wife beater, and jeans. But he seemed friendly enough as he explained that he was lost and looking for the way back towards town. Since getting lost in the depth of the Louisiana bayous happens more often than you'd imagine, we didn't think much of it. Politely, but from a distance, we gave him directions back towards town. He thanked us and drove off across a curb and we continued walking on the road. Suddenly, we heard the sound of a truck spinning out on the gravel road and revving its engine. We looked at each other and then, as we heard the crunch of tires coming at us quickly, we broke into an all-out run at top speed. We rounded another curb and there we saw the wooden bridge that flowed over the bayou channel. Without hesitation, we dove under the side and crawled up under the bridge, where it neatly met with the road, huddling as tightly as we could, ignoring the spiders and ants that we disturbed. The truck came roaring up and over the bridge, and then turned around and came back. The man stopped the truck on the bridge and got out, coming to stand by the railing, he then walked the length of the bridge on both sides, 
frequently looking over the edge and stopping to peer between the slats of the bridge. Fortunately, we were deep into the shadows that he couldn't have seen us without physically coming down there. After what seemed like forever, he spit, swore, and got into his truck and drove off. We waited for a long time before we crawled out from under that bridge. To this day, I'm convinced he had bad intentions. So creepy, redneck guy. Let's not ever meet again. I live in a small town in the Midwest. It's super safe. The crime rate is pretty low and consists of mostly domestic disputes and traffic violations. There's only about 20,000 people in the town and it seems like I see someone I know or at least recognize out in public every single day. Back in 2008, I was about to turn 19 and wanted to have a real party for my birthday. I graduated from a private Christian high school the year before and hadn't ever partied before, even during my first year at a state university. I just wasn't ever interested because my friends weren't either. I was just the small town girl in a big university who didn't really get noticed other than the guys on my boyfriend's dorm floor asking what I was doing with him. They were hitting on me, of course, but I love my boyfriend. That year, I decided I was going to be different. I had dropped out of college, stupid, yes, I know, and broken up with my boyfriend. I had a few new friends who did party, and they always seemed to be talking about how much fun it was going to be, going to house parties. I wanted my 19th birthday to be the first time I got drunk, so I had my older friends help me buy alcohol and invite all of our close friends over to my house. The night came and went. Fun was had and my friends commented on how great my house was for parties. I lived alone in a three-bedroom house with an attached garage, so people who wanted to stay over could stay in one of the bedrooms, and people who wanted to smoke had easy access to the garage. We sometimes moved my car out of the garage and played beer pong in the garage, too. My friends really pushed the idea of having more parties, and I loved the thought of meeting new people, so we started partying at my house literally every weekend. It wasn't hard to get people to come out to our parties. It was August, and there were three colleges around our town. More than once, my house was full of people I didn't know. I woke up a lot with random strangers in my house, but... One of my friends always took responsibility for inviting each stranger over. It was no big deal to me. I would just clean up the house, go to work during the week, and have another party on the weekend. These parties weren't crazy or anything. There weren't any drugs involved, just alcohol, which I thought was totally safe. One day in September, when I was leaving for work, I went to shut the garage door and noticed that the garage door remote wasn't on the car's sun visor, where I usually kept it. I thought maybe it had fallen off, so I got out and searched under the seat. I was more annoyed than scared, because I thought I had maybe taken it out while I was drunk or something to close the garage door instead of using the remote attached to the wall by the entrance into the house. I shut the garage door with the wall remote and went through the house to get back into my car and go to work. That night at work, I clocked out for lunch, and as soon as I entered the parking lot, my phone rang. It was a block number. The caller ID just said, unavailable. I thought it was one of my friends calling me as a prank, because that's something that we did a lot in high school. I answered, expecting someone to ask me something stupid in a weird accent but there was nothing. I mean, complete silence. I thought it was weird, but just hung up anyway. I didn't want to waste my lunch break dealing with stupid pranks anyway. 
Everything continued on as normal as I worked the rest of my shift. We closed the store, and I was walking to my car when I got another call. It was from unavailable again. The same silence rang through the phone when I answered. Absolutely nothing could be heard on the other line. I really thought it was one of my friends. Then, because I hadn't had any missed calls, and how would this person be calling me as soon as I clocked out and had my phone on me? My friends knew my schedule, so that was the only explanation. I called my friend Lacey, and she said that she had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't believe her at first, but then her boyfriend verified that she had been with him, and they did not call me. I wasn't sure what to think, but I brushed it off and forgot about it as soon as I got home. I had the next couple of days off, and usually on days off, I slept in pretty late. I woke up at around 11 the next day and got out of bed. I grabbed my phone and went into the living room. My phone rang, and, you guessed it, it was unavailable calling. Again, I heard silence when I answered. This happened a couple of times throughout the day, and I was getting pretty annoyed by then. I was also annoyed that I still couldn't find my garage door remote. I looked everywhere that day, and I finally just gave up. I thought maybe it had fallen out of my car somewhere. Fast forward about three weeks. The calls started happening every single day. The most unsettling part of this is that they would only happen when I was available to answer the phone. I never had any missed calls during work or when I was asleep. As soon as I would step out of my workplace, unavailable would call. When I would wake up in the mornings, unavailable would call. I really thought it was someone going to some great lengths to play a prank on me, but then even weirder stuff started happening. I stopped parking my car in the garage because it was so annoying to go through the house to open or close the garage door. One day when I left for work, I backed up and I heard a loud scraping noise. I got out and there was a huge tree branch underneath my car. I had no idea how they got there, or when it got there, but it sure was annoying getting them out from under my car. About a week, I heard a loud bang at the front door and went to check it out. There was a tree branch sitting on my porch, resting on my front door. This is when I called Lacey and basically told her that I had to stay at her house that night. I was terrified. I went to Lacey's and sure enough, unavailable, called. By now, it had been almost a month since this began and I was so frustrated that I stopped answering. I didn't answer the call and then about five seconds later, Lacey's phone rang. It was from unavailable. We were super freaked out and I told her not to answer it. I knew then that it was either a mutual friend playing a crazy long prank, or we had a real stalker on our hands. I decided to tell one of my managers at work what had been happening. He immediately told me to call the police the next time I got a call, and that if I didn't call, he would. I told him I would call the police as soon as I got off the phone with Unavailable, when he or she called next time. Like clockwork, my phone rang as I walked to my car at my break. I called the police after listening to Unavailable's silence for a full minute. The police basically told me they couldn't trace the call, but that my phone company could. I got the runaround from the phone company, and despite this, the police wouldn't help. They did say that because the person had probably put branches in weird places, they could send a police officer to watch my house for a couple of days to see if they noticed anything. Nothing but phone calls happened for a week. I wasn't too scared anymore. I actually started being pretty mean to unavailable, calling them a coward and asking why they were doing this. After following up with the police, it seemed like the police didn't really believe that someone was actually on my property. 
They apologized that I was scared, but said there wasn't anything else that they could do. The tree branches started showing up in the middle of the night in the middle of my yard, and I would hear banging noises on my front windows at night. For some reason, I did not feel safe anymore in my room, so I started sleeping on the couch. One night, in the middle of the night, I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water. Unavailable called. I was so scared that I called Lacey and she came over. I didn't understand how this was happening because I couldn't see anyone watching me or anything. I never noticed anyone following me or watching me from afar. So what was happening to me? Sometimes there would be napkins inside my screen door or just stacks of blank paper in my grass. I also got markers in my mailbox and sometimes there would be candy wrappers on top of my car. Whoever was doing this was really, really strange. This went on until Christmas time. On Christmas Eve, I was driving out to my grandpa's farm to have Christmas with them and I got a call. I was angry by now and I thought that I could have had a holiday in peace. I picked up the phone and started screaming at the person on the other end that it was Christmas and they should really just let me celebrate with my family. I called them a freak and asked what they wanted. I was crying and asking them to just leave me alone. And as always, there was nothing but silence. That night, I was sleeping on the couch and I woke up to lights in my face. Someone was shining several flashlights into my windows. I wasn't sure what to do, so I ran to the bedroom, locked the door and called Lacey. She drove over, and we looked around and found no one. I was so, so scared, but she stayed over, and that made me feel a little bit more safe. The calls kept coming, and the police still did nothing. Nothing else happened outside my house. No branches or weird things turning up. I started sleeping in my room again, because I thought maybe they had backed off. One morning... I woke up and went into my dining room and noticed through the kitchen door window that my garage door was open. I thought maybe it had gotten stuck on something when I put it down, so it had gone back up. It has a center so no one would get stuck under the door, I guess. Without me noticing, I went to the kitchen door and shut it with the uh, wall remote. I grabbed a glass of milk and went to go sit down at the dining room table. And that, when I saw it, my missing garage door remote was sitting on my dining room table. Of course, I freaked out. I was still in my pajamas, but I ran to my car and drove. I didn't even know where I was going. I just called Lacey and told her it was time to move. We had been talking about moving to a different city for a while and I told her it was time to go. Her and her boyfriend came over to check the house with me, but no one was there. Me and Lacey got an apartment in a different city, and the calls stopped as soon as we moved. I remember it was Valentine's Day. We were having a girl's day out. I told her that I was going to leave my phone at home so we could just enjoy a movie. I think we saw He's Just Not That Into You. I asked her if I could leave it plugged up on her charger that was in the kitchen, and she said yes. Before we left, she said to wait for me to plug it in, and we left through the kitchen door. So, we went out and we went to the movies. We were chatting about the movie on the way back to the car, and I saw something sitting beside my car on the ground. My stomach immediately sunk when I saw that it was my phone. We both died a little on the inside and stayed at her boyfriend's house that night, and there was no sign of anyone being in our apartment the next day when we got there. That was the last weird and scary thing that happened to me. Unfortunately, I never got to find out who did any of this. No one fessed up to it, 
And I know my friends wouldn't have let me live in a state of constant fear for nearly five months. I asked a couple of the random people I'd met at some of my house parties, but they had no idea what I was talking about. So, creepy, silent, weird, present-leaving stalker. Please, let's not meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. I would like to take a brief moment and give a special thank you to the Reform members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mee, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all so much for remaining loyal subscribers and supporters. I really do appreciate each and every last one of you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.